I'll be reading some poems from my book, Herds of Bears Surround Us, by Red Dragonfly Press in 2010. I want to read a few poems at the beginning from the section, There's Something in a River. The first poem, A Black Bear Near the Cemetery. On the way to work, a mature, myopic black bear blocked my road. When my brakes squealed, he sniffed for directions, galloped through the jewel weed, and disappeared beyond the graveyard. Year by year, more bears return to Pierce County, hide between the bluffs and feed on bitter cherries and black caps. Once I dreamed a herd of bears surrounded me, were eyeing me, and spoke to one another in English. Last winter, I dreamed a huge bear joined our group of singers, wrapped his arms around our shoulders, and wept. When I gather with my friends tomorrow, I'll try to sing for the dead ones in my family in my scratchy baritone voice. Here's the poem Spring and Steinbeck in Salinas. There's something in a river which every fence post can fear. Steinbeck saw it in Salinas, and when the rains came, hatred grew as if from the soil. An old Finlander from Esko knows, but she cups her hands and drinks from a spring, then goes alone hunting wild leeks. Over the Wabasha backwaters, swans fly north to the tundra. A dogfish rolls where the Amtrak follows. My craving for town things stirs up the mud in my soul as I recognize the swoosh. There's something in every river that moves the earth and water toward the briny prawn fish bed and that hole which collects all the silt, the fear, and white fishbone tines. The moment is near. Today, Ruth, who's dying of cancer, moved into Mary's house, her hospice for the end. Turkeys have come off the hilltop to parade on the lawn. It's spring, and four toms with long, full beards fan their tails for the females. The snowfield runoff plunges beneath Mary's driveway bridge. And in minutes, that water will spill into the big river. Along the backwater, more than 50 eagles perch, prepared for a long flight north. As soon as that last black ice dissolves on the lake, they'll fly to their high stick nests in the mysterious white pine groves we've only heard of. And the moment is near. In the belly of a cod. On a Queensland trawler, in the belly of a cod, fishermen found a human head. It may be a Jonah, or an Australian Geppetto, or a skull from an old Norse myth. The Pacific waters are cold and deep and hold songs that lead cod home. Only some of us can die at our headwaters reef and sing at its thrashing barrier. But maybe for a while, the skull sang in a choir and his song brought him back to the shore.
Tears. In this world, many tears are shed, and the store for them is endless. Earth holds her tears in her marshes, her fens and bogs. The tears of people sear their eyes, sting their sorrowful tongues. Even tears of happiness are born of mortality and pain. The last tears of Jesus were of his blood and contained all the grief of humankind, all the grief which had been and all that would be. Some say that rainbows are made of light dancing through the tears of angels. For only angels can know at once all the joy and all the sorrow on earth and in the heavens. And the most tender of all are the tears flowing from the eyes of our dead when they come to see us one more time and we don't know how to respond. A chill. Something chills my heart when I see lines of Herefords fattening in my neighbor's feedlots. Their brown backs shiver as they dip their long white heads into troughs of conveyor corn. Once, during a campaign against brucellosis, I tracked interstate heifers through lading bills, veterinary tests, and auction barns. I was 26. My search for deceit and other men's greed killed some of my kindness. When I quit inspecting cattle, no one missed me. I went to Mexico, worked for an arrogant missionary, and kept diaries, hoping that one day I'd profit from my experience. But I failed to find a buyer. As I kneel to drink from Pine Creek's current, steers watch from their downstream pasture and my open palm is a fine, leaky cup. Here's another poem about flowing water. After reading Lucky Luck in Gold Town. In this Hungarian folktale, a stream flowed without a fish or creatures in it. Because nothing ever died there, it stayed pure. When the stream learns this, it rises three times and tries to murder the messenger. As thieves ford the stream, they drown with their stolen horses. After these deaths, anyone can catch fish. A century ago, when Andrew Lang collected the story. He cheated on the translation. He cleaned out some violence and made more money too. To live past 50, I had to know how to cheat and lie, to risk drowning in deceit and to do so with integrity. This is part two of the section of poems, There's Something in a River. Snow has fallen. An inch or two of snow has fallen. Summer's earth-born beauties are covered. Among the nettle stalks, darkness decays the dead leaves. Isn't snow like death? No one will ever see my prickly face again. No one, maybe our curious hound, will hear me rustling, struggling with my concerns on the other side. Yet, because of the snow, because of seeds and saints 
and accident survivors. I sense that somehow the sun's warmth will return. I watch the chickadees flit from stem to dead stem. They pick at weed seeds and sing against the cold. A chickadee warrior is the bravest of all. He defends his kin against any large thing. He is steadfast, courageous, and in the worst winter he won't flee. Gray, white, and black, he's beauty with only three tones of his color. Joyous, he sings and dances when the slightest streak of dawn cracks open. He's social, and he chirps while snowflakes drop slowly, beautifully, and easily. Even in a blizzard, he finds a refuge. He tucks himself in and waits for what's impossible to defy to pass. I've watched the gray day arrive out of a black dawn. Snow begins again. The lawn's white. The sky's white. And if it weren't for the gray trees and chickadees, I wouldn't know where earth stops and sky begins. Another poem, January Storm. I carry hay to the white-eyed wind local horses as they jolt from the corral to the feeding shed. Their hooves skid on the gray ice and their rumps shiver with uncertainty. The temperature's dropping and the wind feels like many small razors skipping across my face. With so little snow this year, dust blows off the bean fields, coats the frozen patch ice, and dirties all my windows. It's so cold. Even my angry demons leave me alone. I'm on my own. Another poem, A Salt Block in the Horse Pasture. When winter drives me deeper into myself, I sink beneath banks of envy. Self-pity hardens like blood on dirty snow. But isn't everyone's life pockmarked? In the pasture, a muddy spot shows hoof marks and tongue grooves where deer licked frozen dirt. The salt block and its chips melted the snowfall. Then, overnight, the deer came from all directions. Let salt be a drill bit in my life's toolbox. Let it penetrate my crusty fears. Let me remember this calm pasture. Let the deer lick my wounds. And another, like a pacing Shakespeare. Although he's almost asleep, the horse's long black tail swats at the swarm of flies who thrive on the sweat in his flank. Nearby, electrified larvae emerge from the slopped balls of his shit in grass. So many urges, shining, swelling, and turning toward the light. Like Shakespeare, who paced and gazed into London sewers and watched for the mother goddesses to birth squirmy children, a vulture with feathery dark curiosity glides down to three dead raccoon along Highway 35. He makes bald their bones and releases an invisible something back to the safe old growth woodland. Another poem, Before Slipping Into Sleep. 
There's a way a car speeds into twilight so that a shy deer, a lumbering fisher, or the slow cat hears something. Its pitch rises, but they can't see it, and they die. Sometimes at night, before slipping into sleep, I'm able to see, slowly, what connects places to events, my people to me, and me to you. Then suddenly, everything goes black. White Pelicans I get a sad smile when I see white pelicans swimming among the ashes and the dark maples that tower over the flood's black water. They are homely angels in a cathedral twilight, graceful, slow, each feeding alone on a current as steady as gravity and as deep as grief. Only a loon. A snapping turtle can take our pain into dark places. In autumn, when he rises for his last breath, he can take a cracked heart into the cold mud and bind the wound through the winter. But a loon is crazy. He's like a street corner prophet. His god is an echo who sings back to his derelict's longing. The loon collects grief like panhandled dollars to carry south in the fall and drop into the warm Florida Gold Coast Sea. Couple bee poems. The Bee and the Mosquito. A bee bragged to a mosquito. Every morning, Another person crazy for the sweetness of God follows me from the flower fields to my queen, my hive, and honey. The mosquito replied, Why such arrogance? Who woke those sleepers in the middle of the night and made them crazy in the first place? Bees Honeybees prefer the nectar of the youngest blossoms. Ground bees delight in the ripened fruit on the grass. The honeybee turns nectar to honey, then dies and is pushed from the hive. The ground bee dies sated in the sugar of fallen fruit. Here's one. Facts. Facts are like gnats. In half light, they take on the shape of the head that attracts them. One more in this section. The wild bluebird flew out the door. That wild bluebird we thought tamed and safe flew out the door and feeds on enormous clouds of black gnats and mosquitoes. Let's let it fly and whirl in the morning sky. Inside our house, sleep and happiness have already eaten the grit of yesterday's misery. Poems from the section about my time at the Red Wing Correctional Facility. No one told him. When he enters the juvenile prison, his face hardens to meet the metal doors. His ears turn as unreceptive as security glass. His bones stiffen against the concrete. With his cheekbones like stone bluffs and eyes like slivers of steel, he's heard of Red Wing, the staff, 
the sight and his time. No one told him that depression is coming and his adulthood will have to start inside it. Another one, unwelcome students. Unwelcome students enter my room like slow tar, the walls foul with their attention. When asked to leave, they're unwilling or unable to retract that attention. If I guide them away, they change and swarm like gnats with insincere conversation. They leave behind stains, dark odors, and the eruptions of my own malevolence. An inmate weeps on his math test. On a day as beautiful as a trillium among the hardwoods, an inmate weeps on his math test. Outside, the sun warms the grass, and a burdened heron flies over the institutional trees. A week into his recidivist sentence, something's moving inside him, through his mind, through the fisty muscle in his throat, through his tear ducts, then over his shivering lips. I slide a box of tissues to him. My work is to be nearby, correct his tests, send my words halfway across his table, and wait. There's a couple of short poems. This first one is based on some poems by Tomas Tranströmer, who worked in a Swedish correctional facility for youth. The swans have to migrate. Spring. Clouds so low, swans have to migrate past the boy's open window. Here's another short one. Sarcasm. Sarcasm is the razor wire a clever boy unrolls around his fear. Here's another one with a chip on his shoulder. By that practiced walk, you know, he's 16 and already he carries a piece of concrete curb on his shoulder. Rotary saw burrs. Listen, a rotary saw burrs through two by fours. It's a springtime sound I knew years ago in Janesville. But today, January 7th, it's 10 below zero, and contractors install windows on this school for juvenile prisoners. Two immature hummingbirds. Two immature hummingbirds died of thirst, then dried like mummies between the storm window and the double hung sash on the backside of the administrator's building where hearing officers may grant parole. Trick or treat. With my hand inside a skunk pelt and hidden under my desk, I offer trick or treat to the boys as they enter my classroom on Halloween. Because they expect candy, they scatter like fish as fur emerges in their midst. As with grace or hatred, What's inside 
can't always be recognized. The sweet peach hides a delicate taste in a hard, possible future. The homely coconut bears the milk from paradise. My student with fetal alcohol syndrome. Under his flat black brow, his eyes are spotted pearls peeking through the briars of fear. In his growing panic, chaos wrestles with his arms, his legs, and self-righteousness. Maybe the brush thins out inside his mind, and baby raccoons roll in a ball at his feet, and he rests under tall, thick, belief trees, and the moon shines, and Jesus holds his hand. And finally, the snake in anger class. The boys in this class are teenage pedophiles, rapists, or boy toy prostitutes. They're here for enforced anger treatment. After I tell the lindworm story about an enormous snake who kills all his brides until a wise one scrubs him with lye and wire brushes, my students draw crazy snakes on large flip chart papers with colored markers and crude, jagged lines. However, one boy who revels in Satanism and the disgust he provokes quickly and lightly pencils an elaborate snake. As a child, his mother kept him close, too close, and she guided his small organ by hand. Then he forced small girls to do the same. In class, his coiled snake rears a hooded head and its two perfect teeth drip gray blood and the venom he's drawn with his deft and practiced touch. This is the section Blue Music from the Star Cafe. The first poem, Mississippi Ecstasy, number one. I love the casual jumping of happy frogs and rolling otters in lagoons, the plop of turtles in the chocolate water after sunning on a tangle of logs. I love the droop of wide willows and wiggling maples this river opens to the rocks and rapids of joy. Even tugboats and white yachts, their diesel engines rev. They reject moderation, all hesitancy or fear. Here they come, here they come, rolling in a chorus of barge bangings and grain shoot noise. Let the locks and dams of my anger dissolve. My heart's working overtime. My feet mark the cold shore. Remove my distress and rid my despair. Let happiness flood my muddy rib cage. Two. Boulders tumble from the limestone bluffs onto pheasant nests and highways where men are working beneath vigilant buzzards who spin and wobble on updrafts, where boys sag past boarded Ben Franklins, where Harleys sped away and I stood in blue smoke, where I heard a flap close on a leather wallet before it slipped into the boss's pocket. This river follows a dream world, but... As with a map, a manuscript, or runes, one never really catches up. Here it comes. 
Here it comes. This river promises more than it gives. Number three. Yet this river is my joy, my grief and my joy. This water, this joy, this sadness. It's hot and cold, swift rolling water, spilling and splashing down the inevitable journey between green islands and white palisades, under cavorting eagles and impossible bridges, always more than the crush and explosion of dreams, always more than the swell and collapse of happiness. Here it comes, here it comes, with pearls and clams and the continent soil, this sorrow, this joy, this rise and demise. God's fingers won't stop this river. Another poem, John at the Piano. John's hands are tarantulas that skitter over the ivories. His beret-laden all-souls skull hangs from music's rear-view mirror. What does he see with his eyes so wide? The blues and the fist behind the blues. His voice and herky-jerky piano are road bricks thrown at you like some shoeshine's prophecy. He doesn't embrace the world. He can't get comfortable in the world, but he's right behind it. Between sets, he walks across the road, hunched with his hands in his pockets. You watch him wrestle with his soul as he bends over a bridge railing and looks down on the Mississippi as if it were carrying off his wife. another poem, the piano player said, it's okay. I drive muted miles from St. Paul and listen to a trumpet. It cries to the stars. Even the emptiness is trembling. Then a piano player sings, it's okay to be a soul survivor on the expressway to your heart. It's okay to lift up loneliness with a solo. He searches each word for everyone's ache. He opens a dark beauty from the smallest grain of grief, the way an ant works on the peony. And when he sings a drawn out you, an unused viol hums. Blue morning glories unfold, and the old scales soften around my heart. After hearing the Nova Jazz Orchestra, I see 13 dark holes with halos, exuberant annunciators of joy. They are trumpets, trombones, and saxophones, held inside a rhythm section's arms. Gabriel's mysterious tones drop around the intricate valves, tumble through the curved brass, slide through slippery golden sewers and erupt into a trembling tavern room. A fan blows cigarette smoke to the roof. I hear the composer's inner life, his swelling heart, his steady drive, his lover's intelligent laughter. Music leaps into my ears and curls around my bones. The room transforms, the air sizzles, the round nest of my wounded feelings now cradle a tiny blue egg of joy. I want to play my black guitar. I want to play my black guitar to a god who listens, but he hangs in a hammock that's hung from the stars and I can't find the moon in the sky. 
I want to play my black guitar to a God who listens. My faith falters. It really happens. And I can't wake my wife to my pain. Swans are sleeping in the shallow water near freezing Alma. A lonesome hound howls down the coulee and the songbirds have long flown south. I want to play my black guitar to a God who listens. I'm a stick in cold ashes. My heart's a gray river. The fire's gone out from my soul. I want to play my black guitar to a God who listens. I want to play my black guitar, but it's broken. And one more for this first part of the section. Listening to Beethoven's Moonlight Sonata. My soul is a red current between the first finger of loneliness and beauty's curved thumb, squeezed again and again onto the long tongue of the moon. Here's the poem entitled, Jeepers, The Dreamers Are in Love, a Kalimba dream song. Blueberries dance on a kalimba's tongue. Red newts and frogs lead the parade. We're following close by. Someday we'll leap and cakewalk to that carrot-colored moon. Jeepers, the dreamers are in love. Jeepers, we're dreamers in love. Two chipmunks run to our house, rush up the drapes and giggle. The merganser family waddles up the stairs with a platter of fish moose and crackers. Jeepers, the dreamers are in love. Jeepers, we're dreamers in love. Call the neighbors and their sleepy kids. They don't have to comb their hair. They can wear their polka dot pajamas. Let's eat, let's laugh. Let's waltz in our slippers. Jeepers, the dreamers are in love. Jeepers, we are dreamers in love. Now, here's a poem. The guitar player with a pearl earring after two paintings by Vermeer. I never kissed her cranberry lips. I only listened to the bees guarding her heart. She said to me, how long must I play for you? Shake off your shyness. I said, your smile is lightning across the sky of my heart. She said, your hesitation is a storm ready to rain on my zinnias. Next one, Ragamala Dancer. If I don't trust your smiles, I have good reason. They serve something beyond goodwill. They're not at all like those of a cheerleader. They are dangerous, inward avalanches. Around your throat, the gold necklace is a range of mountains on fire. Your trembling fingers are gentle reins, and your arched body is a tripled rainbow. My knuckles begin to sweat, and my toes curl as your dancer's eye paint pulls me into those white orbs with their pools of black ferocity. You could take cannonballs, pop them like bubblegum between your lips and swallow them. You break the wall of my armory. Your hands thrust from this stage into the world of a she-tiger 
where your teeth shatter my rabbit bones. Another? Swans who ferry Saraswati. Before the Junjungan temple, I watched two girls dance, bedecked as Balinese goddesses. Their fingers bend upward and move like the wings of the swans who ferry Saraswati. I have sons, but I would love a daughter so beautiful, gifted, and visible. Imagine being 14, your mother painting your makeup, your father playing the gamelan flute, your neighbors at the gongs and drums, your body an aircraft for a goddess. Because goddesses depart with the dance, the girls stand so small and deflated as they shake my hand with thank yous in choppy English. Then, while still dressed in gold, they mount their motorbikes and flee through the night toward home. To the other side of the world, Flamenco de Hoy. When Pedro Cortez strums his guitar, honey hives grow more frenzied and prairie dogs dive for cover. La Conja, in her red sheer skirt, dances with the fury of bison stampeding across a wooden bridge. Her calves dart in and out of other worlds. Sharks circle inside her elbows. Although her breasts slump, her slight plump belly quivers like lava in the sea. Her beautiful behind is a shivering peony conjuring a thunderstorm. She's an Egyptian tiger who glares at us, then grins from Mount St. Helen's lap. And here's the long poem. Yada churns the ritual sea and maidens rock in Oles. On a sweltering Saturday in July in Maiden Rock, Wisconsin, in Oles Bar, three musicians play just for fun. Yada sings and chords his guitar. Gib hits a small snare and a hi-hat, and Steve's brought his sousaphone. When Yada begins, light my fire. The 35-year-old song is more because of our years and Steve's achy sousaphone solo. Yada strums new life into the stale words, and the memories lead our hearts to the inner dance halls and pavilions. The dark years since adolescence add shadings to the teenaged lyrics. Our knees hop, our backs swivel, and our hips begin to sway. The bar's mahogany shadows resonate like the wine glass, which a nail painted mother fingers. She once danced with a carpenter whose bold and upright legs melted against her thigh. She remembers his hand's strong grip on her future. Gib grins, wraps his snare, rattles his cymbal, and embellishes Yada's strum. Melodies float like the patchouli he tasted years ago on the West Bank. Rhythms return to him. The magic is back. Through each revolution of the ceiling fan, the unseen world is glimpsed and glimpses back. Motes of light, as if distant moons, reflect in a stack of cocktail glasses. There's a sing-along twinkle in everyone's eye. There's a hum above the bass notes, like an ancient chant from our cave at the bottom of the bluff. 
laughter and gratitude warm the room, heat our souls, and spark a divine emotion. A motorcyclist leaning in the doorway explains the Venturi effect as air rushes through the narrow opening. In the heaviest heat, when no one expects more than a cold beer, a musical magician churns the right liqueurs. Who could know that the bachelorette party would use the Venturi breeze, the Motown moves, the rock and roll brown-eyed girl with her heart thumping down in the hollow moment to descend into Oli's. The bride-to-be and her retinue enter our cavern, which is filled with the music of their elders, a tavern filled with life's ruin and resurrection. Where the dartboard hangs, an unseen hurler has thrown a perfectly aimed projectile. The young women, with their creamy faces and excited bodies, circle the bride-to-be and push her toward a ritual chair where she teases and admires a seated, goateed man-stranger. She practices her chest rolls, the one that will call her groom to bed, the ones she'll offer him for promises, the ones that will beckon a soul from the invisible world so that she might bring a child into this world. The Dionysian maenads circle Yada, and he never stops drumming. He churns the ritual sea. He stirs the river's foam for Aphrodite. This is a holy gopi dream, the rite of a pre-matrimonial goddess. The young women's breasts play with Yada's knees. Their sexual vessels spark with lightning as they bob and throb and lift toward the music. It's the voices and the sousaphone's vast horn curled like a great goddess's vaginal tract. Venus and Isis and Ishtar arrive. Those of us with grown children remember and admire this prelude to marital matings. The tavern's entranced. The music gets higher, whistling and dancing into a cyclone. As Gibb drives harder, hits the one as he should, the women dance up on the bar. Their shaking creates ecstatic displays as we elders witness the miracles. The sourest man gets light on his feet. A prude giggles and tickles her husband. A bartender's embarrassed. The jukebox won't take money. No one goes to the bathroom. But as quickly as they arrive, the maidens return to the evening while the musicians play on and on. Who knows if they fled to the hills, to husbands or strangers down the road. Maybe Krishna ferried them across the river. Maybe they were baptized by John. Maybe they kissed the waves on Lake Pepin or merely drove back to the farm. Beside the Mississippi River on a hot Saturday evening, if the July sky is cloudless, if the moon is yet to rise, if each star is a dancing pearl, the music may bring you a goddess. The Large Heartedness of Sleep In the large heartedness and non-thinking way of sleep, in the twilight before dawn, something wants me to remain happy and lazy as I reach to touch you across whatever distance we've made. Whether we kissed goodnight or rolled pitifully away from one another, I always love you in the morning. After sleep has discarded reason and flushed all the logic of your limits and mine, I can't hold back my hand.
but the alarm rings and the sun burns off the fog. Our other lives rouse us from bed. Beyond the bedroom, we hear quarreling wrens, two Red Hampshire roosters, and Erickson's grain dryer starting its roar. Just an argument. Just an argument between a husband and wife, a bickering beneath the bluff's limestone parapet. You settled on a boulder. I took to a tree limb. Curt words lifted to cottonwood leaves, and a spider slid into the river. When the sun fired through the silent choir of clouds, the awe stopped our spat. A gray heron found the low place to land and preen. A beaver, her neighbors now quiet, waddled from the cold water to munch evening breakfast. All the while, the river scratched at another lip of a trilobite bedded in the old sea stone. Sweetness and Contentment Outside the window, peony buds are about to burst into red bowls of fragrance. I hear wrens whistling in the soft rain. From the bathroom, I hear water spill as my love showers. My heart fills with sweetness and contentment. I'm quiet and near peace with the gray rain, the dark trees, and our iridescent life. Forgive me. Tonight, ugly chrysanthemums of smoke spewed from the bug-eyed, flare-nosed gargoyle in my heart. And here's a poem after Uncle Tao Chin. A walk behind an old Percheron. A few summer photos are on the kitchen table. Weary shoulders, a paunch, and uncomfortable eyes. It must be me. I'll never know again the deer runs I had as a boy, my young tail flashing into the woods. I tread more slowly now. As I walk behind the old Percheron, plodding toward the good pasture, he farts. He's just getting old, too. My sleep is fitful these days, even before the roosters crow above one another. Last night, I argued with my wife. It doesn't matter who was right. A clear morning lifts out of the cricket's waning calls. Shadows stretch and I hear far-off hammering, a young neighbor's building something. And here's a poem. My heart splits open like a grape. Sometimes my heart is a bear, sleeping in a culvert beneath a country road. Sometimes it's a cucumber, slowly swelling until its prickles fall off. Jess drives up in the pickup. The cab roof is crushed. The driver's door is crinkled and the windshield shimmers like chain mail. Sunlight pours over his shoulder. I see his dark, frightened face and my heart splits open like a grape in the sure beak of an elegant bird. Fishing on Bowstring Lake 
an osprey sways over a rice bed as Tony, Dad, and I drift for walleyes. That grass bar is a finger which the lake grabs like an infant. Old dry reeds rustle like hair in the electricity of love. Down the bay an eagle, watching from a dead tree, swoops low off its perch and flies just above the waves, under the osprey's radar. At the scum-bottomed rice bed, the eagle attacks from below, curving, screaming, and lifting to spoil the fish hawk's day. But the osprey tumbles and darts away. We've drifted into shallow water, and the two birds depart in opposite directions. After Tony starts the outboard, we leave while waves become ripples among bulrushes and rice stems. Another. At 53, I read Pearl Buck's God's Men. I've hammered each nail into each shingle on my roof. I've earned this laziness on the couch. As I read Pearl Buck's novel, written the year I was in the womb, about missionaries and their children's obsessions, sunlight fades and the room darkens. I love the smell of old books, the dry couch and coming rain. The words of God's men come and go as the rain runs to the gutters and downspouts. My poems, too, move, splashing out the spout of my curiosity. Next one. Wine-colored elderberries, blood-colored elders. The red-berried elder bears a bland fruit, the color of blood. Its bluish stems look like the veins in Aunt Hattie's arms. The elderberry grows wine-colored fruit. Its berries turn indigo and soften as they age. Their tang becomes sweet and musty. I've arrived at the age where Uncle Harold's traits are mine, and they've become my husk and my pulp. Today, I fear less of this ripening life, but my friends are dying, and I recognize the wine press. Oh, go to bed. If I stand at the Maiden Rock Quarry, and bob my head, I see small, petrified shells twinkling in the sunlight. The hot sun clings to the limestone face, and I feel fondness for the stones, the sun, and the fossils. These odd moments feel like those with my old aunt, who poured a strong coffee and served coconut cake from the bakery. Her stories were cluttered with repetitions, and they hardened under the pressure of her grief. After coffee, she had me pour her a jigger of Jack Daniels over crushed ice, and the liquor glittered in her tall glass. When the afternoon's glare draped her brow, she'd squint toward the west and scold the sun. Oh, go to bed. And it did. My brother John's house. In a dream, I went to see my brother John, dead now for 30 years from a tumor. He died at nine years old. His head radiated and bald. His scar, a tire track to his crown. In the dream, 
John's hair fell like long, dark feathers around an adult face. In his living room, with its walls of coal, he introduced his family for the first time. His children smiled. They had his black hair. And his wife brought me biscuits and scones. He said, This is my grandma's house and I came to care for her garden. He wore the smile of a satisfied man who knows where he's at and loves what he is. I want to visit again that house where John's wife served me tea from a pewter platter. But I've forgotten the way and John didn't give directions. Another, without closets. In my old farmhouse, there are no closets. We use armoires, dressers, desks, and old-fashioned wardrobes to store private things. And our secrets have to stay inside us. No wonder old Scandinavians were so tight-lipped. No wonder they wouldn't travel far from home. On vacation, they would have had to take their secrets with them. It wouldn't be right to leave one behind in the middle of the room. While you're gone, a busybody might drop by and see it dancing off the ladder back chair or whistling to the clock's rhythm or filling the house with its odor of burnt toast or boiled cod. Like kids in a game of hide-and-seek, they stiffen behind Grandma's stuffed chair. Yet a secret can't resist sticking out its head just as someone walks into the room. I'm thankful to the inventor of closets, and I truly believe in mercy. So maybe it's best that we not see more than long, tipsy toes poking from under the living room drapes. Here's a two-part poem, Stories and Grandma's Chinese Porcelain. Number one. With our heads against her Irish hips, Grandma told us Goldilocks stories, or a Chinese story, while tracking her finger on a blue and white porcelain plate. In the plate's world, two forlorn lovers crossed white water on an arched blue bridge to an island where they transformed into lovebirds, and they flew forever in the plate. When I kissed her goodbye, Forty years later, on the day before she died, I remembered the lovebirds in her locking oak bookcase, where the plates in her copy of the Rubiat were safe and away from the children. When I learned her plates were neither porcelain nor Chinese, but mass-produced pottery from Ohio, it didn't matter. I had already crossed the Blue Bridge. Part Two My wife and I bought a farm that once belonged to a potter. His kiln bricks are the walkway to an outhouse. Last spring a friend told us how the finest porcelain, Ming Dynasty or Tang, was made from the fill of outhouse holes by potter families who mapped and tracked their family soil, sometimes for 500 years. They worked their fingers in the white clay, threw it on their family wheels, shaped it, glazed it, and fired it, until their stories were just right. Fair, not fair. I've grated my cabbages into a crock, even their hearts and tough stems. 
I followed my father's recipe, mixed salt and slaw in layers, and put a water bag seal on top. My father demanded, be fair. It's hard to do. Others taught that life's just not fair. It's not if you are always thirsty for someone else's life. The final poem in this section, he's got the whole world in his hands. When dad sang my wild Irish rose, mom smiled, then blushed. Sometimes I would be red with envy, but more often I was proud. His voice rose above our childhoods, and now we all love to sing. On Christmas, we wrap our arms around one another and sing, O Holy Night, the first Noel, and he's got the whole world in his hands. I begin that last song in a blues voice, never sweet, nor mocking, nor sentimental, a voice earned on the streets in Frogtown. When the tempo shifts, Claire's hips sway, Daniel claps and Dad shimmies like a minnow in a holy man's hand. Then grace comes nearly every year from the low and the dark, and we rise like the faithful to repeat the sounding joy. This section is entitled Into the Ocean Without Shores. That comes from the very first poem here. Into the Ocean Without Shores, after Rabia Bent Cobb. The wild woman said, Love is an invisible ocean without shores, and wise people don't swim in it. The singers in this room say, Let's get wet. I say, To the hell with that, let's swim. The old man whispers, Let's sink. poem once at the frog pond once at the frog pond in the fountain at Como Park I saw you and I thought you were my soul now when I'm lonely I want you I'm so thirsty I go to the bar and drink beer for me you've been like the Australian frog who buries herself in the desert. Thirsty locals know where you are. This fire I am. I love this fire I am because it lights you up and me, and I live more easily with your cloudy scent. I've worked my nose hard and have taken in the cedar barks yellow resin drop fragrance. Your sweetness is worth the effort. When put to your stickiness, my desire melts you and you rise into small bowls inside me where you meant to be. The glass brick. I was dreaming. I was so happy. I knew your love would hold me forever. Now, I can't remember you. My mind is a glass brick. Light and shades enter, but not your face. My heart knows you, but it's pierced by my forgetfulness, and I can't stop aching for you. Another poem in a tantrum of loneliness. Sometimes, years after a boy throws an apple core at his friend, a tree grows along the roadside. Then, on a windy day, its blossoms scatter, 
Green apples appear, and the hidden seeds form pentagrams in sour fruit flesh. When the apples sliced crosswise in autumn, your life can be divined by the shape of the seeds. An old world diviner might have said, silver apples are wild love songs from a crazy Irish goddess. Robert Frost might have said, stars and seeds are beads thrown by God in his tantrum of loneliness. But I heard this, your heart carries one seed of insane desire for your friend. Another, outside Las Vegas, after Kabir. Why do you, my twin, have the jitters? If the Holy One cares for squirmy otters, dung-dipped cowbirds, and locusts who clatter in the trees, if he held you while we were still in the womb, why wouldn't he hold you now? How could we have ended up in a 1969 Rambler living outside Las Vegas? We've made too many friends who sit all night at the slots, and we wait to sing in casino shows. We've left the Holy One for poker chips on an empty green table. Here's another. Love as Peter did. When a mysterious storm brews and color breaks apart in the sky, they tell me, tether up your soul boat, lash the sails of your longing and pull in those oars of desire. You tell me, Love as Peter did, in sail out into the gale. Already white waves multiply and go in your direction. No matter how brightly I paint my boat, it's meant to float onto the darkening water. Here's another poem, A Deep River. A deep river rushes from my chest to my mind. I've hurt too many people, yet I've also carried them out of the back channel swamps. In the middle of the night, the memory of those burdens becomes the Evinrood, which moves me up and down the river and into the water lily lagoons. Here's the poem, The Call. What if you thought you were called to help others and everyone you help begins to suffer more? What if your own life spins into chaos and difficulty and is more painful than before you listened to the call? The call you heard after you stopped drinking, after you tore away the steel doors around your heart when you heard the simple and whispered words, be kind. And for the first part of this section, here's the last poem, a small harmonica. Am I a small harmonica between God's lips? Or am I the breath he blows through the reeds, and I cry as I leave him? A Clam's White Tongue A clam's white tongue licks grains of sugar in sunlit water. Don't tell me it's a foot on sand. Such words damage loveliness. If you carried a river of pearl, wouldn't you prefer it between your lips? Wouldn't you want your loved one to taste the sand as sugar? The clam in sugar water knows what's right 
for its kind. The clarinetist knows the proper note for turning the fear of drowning into joy. And the boiling sap of my soul knows there's a particular temperature when it will instantly become maple sugar. Another poem. Did you dangle your finger? I remember a warm May, its lilac scents, deep green leaves, a bright yellow sky, and then, no, now comes that feeling, heated and flooding my body from deeper inside my body, as if an invisible hand pushes melted butter through my bones. Did the butter flow begin that vague and unimportant day? Like any one of many in my quiet childhood. Or did you today, in providential reverie, casually dangle your finger and twirl it in the river of my life? The next one, a kiss and cowboy coffee. Of the thousands of kisses you've accepted from me, of the thousands you've given, there was one like cool water poured into my boiling cowboy coffee. The frothing quit, the tumbling ground settled, and the dark coffee became strong, clear, rich, warm, and calm. Night Singers We are God lovers, sitting beside the garden with a rude bag of heaviness in our bodies. We are cattle tongues, lapping at the corn in the spiritual trough. At night we sing, we are God lovers, slaughter us now. Take us into your watering mouth. Here's a short, untitled poem for J.D. Look, once again we're drunk and happy, walking beneath this dawn's brilliant mackerel sky. We've already emptied those red clouds and turned them over like cups to dry. Tonight, we will swim in barrels. The poem, Joy Soup. There are nights when a veil drops, and I see that we're swimming in a vast terrain of joy soup. Our mumbled songs, our hoarse shouts, our gurgling, rambling chants simmer over Glenn's crackling, flaming guitar. Our words are fruit grease wiggling to the surface. Robert's poems are honeydews floating in the air. With a cherry in his voice, David sings to a goddess who smacks her lips at the aroma of our cooking souls. Light a match. My poems are just kindling for the stove. Let my words be incense thrown on the charcoal. Let me be a sugar cube dropped into the tea. After an evening of singing and tea, when I arrive home, a moon shines above the two tall spruce in the yard. Their shadows hang as dark as that mouth of the yet to come. From under the trees, a whisper calls, I'm here. Spruce cones and crooked twigs crunch beneath my boot sole. I step below the hanging boughs where the shadows are as thick as honey, and I answer, I'm here too. 
an evening so beautiful. An evening so beautiful, even the moon has envy. She throws off her see-through gown, and so begins our love affair in the garden. Where the rainbow faded at sunset, new stars emerged the way lavender sprouts from the soil. Cottonwoods whisper, fireflies, those love darts from the stars, dance over the hidden meadow. Their codes twinkle and catch our eyes. Then our hearts spin slowly in the shadow of a blooming catalpa. Its white petals drop like warm pearls from the lips of our private goddess. A wide-eyed doe, slender to her flank, flicks her tail flutters her lashes, then bounds away with the grace of a swaying lily. Homage to Whitman. This day, this arch of birch over the log pile, this large sky as blue as a sunfish fin, this pine grove as green as a hunter's coat, this bluff, this corn, this mud-wrinkled road, where immigrant Swedes were captured by the hills, ravines, creeks, and oaks by beauty. This melting snow, this thawing ice, this heart of mine, twisting, turning, dangling, ringing, watching and singing in the clasp of beauty's large fist. I eat beauty, I breathe beauty, I rub beauty onto my chest hairs. The loping dog, the horned ram, the sleek Ford pickup, the echoing chortles of a strutting tom, the taupe fields, the cut stalks. I love the curve of the contoured rose. The rattling maize leaves slice into my heart. The plum bush swings its thorns to my throat. Beauty infects me. I accept the natural hypodermics, all briars and canes, nestles and thistles, dried and dead and working. These skin strippers, these clothes terrors, the ones who wish me naked with them. I love, too, these stink pots, this manure bed, this nest of opossum, rank with winter refuse. This dormant pile of rot, this embraceable torso, this limp cock, this stirring, cracking, shuddering heart opens for them all. Come in, maple sap, lanolin, wet resin, cedar scent, birch bark, elder root, ash gatherer, tractor hum, horse fart, skunk tread, and pocket gopher mound dust. Put me in your furry mouth. Wrap me in your diaper, bathe me in your silky hide, scrub me with your stars. Here's the last poem of the book. Love holds below what will grow above. On his train ride home to Long Island, a workman woke and saw an enormous face spread like a cloud above New York. The next day, he recognized the drawing in the Times. Whitman had died in Camden. Love always holds below what will grow above. It can survive like a potato beneath a battlefield, and neither hooves nor humvees can disturb it. Yesterday, I saw water lily roots, and I remembered one fragrant summer day when my heart bobbed and swayed in the warming sun with you, my love. <laughs>